Thank you. All right. Okay. If we're thinking about um, what phones can do for us, it's extensive. So as I talked about, um, entire films are now being shot in order to prove the effic efficacy and the capabilities, the real range and limits of what a phone can do um, into beautiful effects. So I'm going to go through a bunch of, there are going to be a couple of assignments where you actually have to take photographs yourselves, right? And I'm presuming that all of you have a phone with a camera on it. If you have a flip phone, we need to talk. Um, but if you have a flip tone phone, you're also my hero. <sighs> right on. Um, first things first, when you're given a task to shoot any kind of photography with your phone you, or any camera in general, you want to take a lot of shots, um, as many as you can take. And I know on a phone, you've got to just constantly hit that little button, but you want to aim for about 15, pun intended, aim. And the reason why is evident here. We're going to have a variety of different action shots, and then we're going to have a whole load of images that we are not able or willing to use. Yes? They made it so on iPhone, at least, you can just hold down the photo button and it starts. Which will give you a live photo. And in that live photo setting, which is a very, very helpful, you can select which live photo from that repeated shot you can use. Good. Um, I would recommend that you look in your phone's capabilities to see if it can do that, whether it's an iPhone or not. Um, you want to do it, honestly, you want to go on YouTube and you want to type in your phone and your brand and the model and you want to find out what its range of possibilities are. You want to learn how to actually use these settings beyond just the edit settings after you've taken your photograph. In fact, if you preemptively change those settings, you're going to shoot better photographs in general. Go on YouTube and watch the videos. Trust me, it's, you're, it really is worth your while. Um, especially if you're using your own photography for things like building websites or even just shooting, excuse me, shooting your own work, right? You want to know those settings well. When in doubt, always rely on natural light. Light from the sun. I want you to look around the room here. We've got a bunch of lights going on here. We've got a calibrated light that's from a projector. That's going to be a kind of white light. CMYK? No. RGB. Different. We also have these things. What are these? Fluorescence. Fluorescence. Fluorescence actually have a green tone. So if I stand underneath them, it's not the most flattering light in the world because it's going to bring out some red in my rosacea, right? When you shoot someone and there is a multitude of different light sources, you're going to get colors that you're not intending and you're going to get an unflattering cover, right? So keep that in mind. When in doubt, always go for sun. And when you go for sun, today is the absolute perfect day to shoot photographs. Why? Overcast. The ideal day to shoot is when you have gray coverage throughout, not the scattered, trickled light, but full coverage of um, clouds. If I'm shooting artwork, and I shoot my own artwork, I don't pay for somebody to do it. I shoot my own paintings. I shoot at around 11 a.m. in the morning or 3 p.m. in the afternoon on an overcast day. And why do I do that? Because I'm not going to get harsh directional shadows. I'm going to get an even coverage of light. It's going to bounce around. But if I'm shooting at noon, what's going to happen? If I'm over my photograph or I'm over my object here, what, what's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, my own cast shadow is going to be in it. So you have to take those elements into consideration. Um, if you're shooting something or someone in shade, say you're standing them next to the garage and the light's coming from the other side and it's 5 o'clock at night, they're going to be really, really cool. Their flesh is going to look quite blue which isn't necessarily going to be the most flattering thing. So you want to start sort of anticipating what light is going to do to your color. A lot of people on their phone will whip their phone out and go zoom, 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 take the photograph. Uh-uh. Stop that. Get your butt up, walk close to your subject, I'm just going to use you, walk close to your subject and shoot your subject. Why? Right there. When you do a digital zoom on your phone and you refuse to actually go to the place you're shooting, ow, <laughs> you will have a completely pixelated image because that's not what your phone is set up to do. 
You need to actually move close. That's why when you see a real professional photographer, they're like on the ground getting the best shot, doing the most interesting vantage points in order to get the right shot in the appropriate level of focus, okay? Don't zoom in on that photo. Unless it's an emergency and you're trying to get that guy planting those drugs on that guy, walk up close, okay? Um, all right, use HDR. Can you shut that door? Ah! <laughs> Doing a warm up. All right, HDR. What does HDR stand for? Say it. Say it. Yeah, high definition resolution. HDR is high dynamic range as well. You know it is high definition, but the reality is it's high dynamic range. It means you can do the most when you actually shoot with using that setting. Um, it's increasingly common on smartphones. You probably have it on your, on, your, on your phone. It adds detail from the dark and light areas and will provide you with a really balanced exposure level. And we'll talk about what exposure is in a second. So basically it stops the sky from being too bright and the ground from being too dark and getting completely lost. So things that are in shadow are not falling into black. That makes sense? So get, get to using that. It's always a good option, HDR, but it is a much bigger photograph. So you have to make sure that you're not, you're not working on a Google Chromebook with like one gig of RAM because it's gonna explode, <laughs> okay? All right, use those editing tools. Start using them pre, but also after. You can always redo something or do it even further in post-editing, and that's what that's called, post-editing. Do, think about composition. If I've talked to you at length about composition, your career kind of depends on it. If you're not a very good composer, you're not gonna have very good images in general. You're not gonna be a good video game artist. You're not gonna be a good graphic designer. You're not gonna be a good sculptor, okay? Um, the rule of thirds basically means that the intersection points, and I'll reiterate this, the intersection points of that nine square grid or nine rectangle grid should line up with something that has visual interest. And one of those things should be your focal point. What is the focal point to that image? Building. The ruin, or the rock, it's a rock. <laughs> Looks like a ruin, didn't it? Um, it's generally the most compelling and well-composed shot to use, right? If you're in low lighting, you need to put your phone on something, rest it so that that is not happening. Because if your light is low, your aperture is going to be slower, meaning the lens of the camera will be open for longer in order to capture the light enough to take the photograph. I want you to think about your eyes and the irises of your eyes versus the pupils. What happens when you're in a dark room with somebody and you're gazing into their eyes? What happens to their pupils? They dilate, which means what? They grow, okay? Um, they grow, they open up in order to allow more light in so that you can make sense of your surroundings. It's an adaptive evolutionary feature of our eyes. A camera works exactly the same way, including this one. So if it's a very, very high light situation, if I go outside, that, that shot is gonna go very, very quickly and that aperture is gonna be very quick as well. So the amount of time that lens is open is instantaneous. It's a millisecond, right? So. When you're in a dark place like this, or like inside, and you're trying to shoot good photographs, post up, hold it, so that you're not shaking. But the reality is, they now sell tripods with, uh, with an, a capability of holding the bottom of a phone, because everybody's using their phone. And a tripod will cost you a total of $20 at Walmart, y'all. Tripod. It is the way. Candid shots, get used to them. Start taking them on your phone. You don't have to show them to everybody. Go, oh, bless you. You don't have to show them to anybody, but what candid shots will enable you to be able to do is think about composition all the time in a way that it's second nature. Even if you're, you're, you're not gonna go into photography or anything photography related, it will help you learn how to compose, okay? Take candid shots. Stop with the person in the center, turning right, 
moving their leg up and putting their leg behind them. And angles, like stop with it. Think about rooms, think about architecture, think about the shapes of the space that you're in and using those shapes. Be a better artist and designer. Okay, you've got a phone, you might as well use it. Yeah, try portrait mode, they're pretty, they're nice. You know what portrait mode is, don't you? Yeah, that's how you can do that awesome, um, very professional looking shot. How does this actually work? Portrait mode suggests um, that you're, what you're using is a digital SLR. And a digital SLR will allow you to automatically, or to manually focus, that's what they're doing there, they're focusing. It'll allow you to manually focus in order to play with the depth of field. And the depth of field basically means it's identifying what the subject is and it's saying nothing else is quite as important as this thing I'm focusing on, okay? Can you reverse the depth of field? Can you put the background in complete focus and then her not? Absolutely. And that's what you can do with a digital SLR, single lens reflux camera, the big fancy lens. All right, actually do the thing that photographers do. Squat, lay down, whatever, run. You want to blur? Run. Try it. See what happens. Know what your phone can do. I guarantee you, you all have 3,000 photographs on your phone that look identical to each other. Am I wrong? Me too. No criticism. But if what you're trying to do is actually learn something from it, from this new medium, do it. Yes, you occasionally have to clean your phone's lens. You're always touching it. It's always in your pocket. It's got snark on it. It's got greasiness. It's got chocolate from your binge fest while crying in the tub last night, right? Chocolate, clean it. Chem wipes, have you ever heard of chem wipes? Like chemistry, C-H-E-M, are used typically to clean the lenses in laboratories, but they're also used to clean the lenses of phones and cameras. A lint-free, you know, it cleans your glasses, that will work perfectly, but don't use your clothes. Don't use your clothes. Your clothes will scratch your lens. And yes, you'll see it. And believe it or not, you can now buy a bunch of accessories for your phone. I want you to note how many things are on this, right? Uh, we've got a secondary lens to be able to um, change the settings, which will basically allow you to keep uh, two operations going at the same time. We've got a speaker. We've got, I think, a Wi-Fi, like, in order to upload it live, to do a live. What? A viewfinder. Um, we've got all kinds of things. Um, we've got a tracking device at the very middle there. That's what that is. So, uh, like, YouTubers will now, you'll oftentimes see that when they're walking around, the camera is tracking them. That doesn't necessarily mean someone is actually there moving around with the camera. That means that they have a tracking device on their wherever their apparatus is, wherever their phone is, that will literally sense where they are and move to where they are. 100 bucks can do it. So stuff's changing rapidly. And if you ever use a flash, and, I'm gonna, and this is just for phone photography, if you ever use a flash, use it during the day. And the reason why you would wanna use it, um, in order to get reflections, and in order to get an even tone of light, it's not gonna to matter too much in the day, right? Because the sun is always more powerful. But the reality is, is if you use the flash, when you use the flash and you're in like a club, in the curb, listen to some Beyonce, and you use a flash, what's that gonna look like? What's your, phone, what's your photo gonna look like? It's gonna look a little washed out, what else? Grainy, there might be blur, what else? Okay. Well, what's your question, dear? Um, so what, what scenarios would you possibly use the flash in the day? You see how this photograph actually is in water? Um, using the flash in this will increase the reflection on the water of the subject. So it can be used in order to create an alternative lighting source in order to create a dynamism of the photograph itself. Does that make sense? Mm. Oh, I don't know. If you've got, um, if you're shooting someone and they're jumping over a puddle, like the former photograph I showed you, right? And so an overcast day, it's going to provide another turning up of a reflection that's already going to be evident, right? 
Okay? It's also going to homogenize or just kind of even out skin tone just a little bit in a way that you desire. Right? Because the first thing you, the best rule of thumb for photography, whether it means you're photographing your work, like your paintings or your 2D design projects, what you're going to do is you're going to avoid the flash, but you're going to also avoid as much post-editing as you can. The least post-editing that you do, the better a photograph you're taking. So you should rely on it as little as you can. Make sense? Okay. Focus on light. There's different kinds. There's natural light, which is what we got right now, and it's bouncing around up in here, everywhere. There's going to be all kinds of interactions of light because of the multiple light sources. It's going to be fairly neutral. Um, if you're shooting me for this new assignment, and you're shooting me against the window, you're going to lose a lot of detail. I'm going to be backlit. So if you're in front of me shooting me, you're not going to see a lot. So that's not a great place to take a portrait unless you're trying to create a mood. Makes sense? Um, and then think about reflections. Believe it or not, they add dynamism to an image. Half of this entire composition is made up with a reflection. Does it make perfect sense? Is it a secondary portrait? Not necessarily. It shapes and colors adding visual interest. And it creates that sort of perspective, which leads us right into the subject, which is his face. And compose, compose, compose. Girl, friends, compose. Um, if you're using an iPhone, go to your settings, choose camera, and switch the grid on. When you photograph, it's OK. You can get rid of it. Okay. Put the grid on so that you know things are lining up. Samsung Galaxy, go to your settings, scroll down to switch the grid lines to on, and a Google Pixel, launch the camera app and tap the down arrow, go to more settings, and then grid type. Okay? That's how you find them. Use suggested lines in order to lead your eye throughout the picture plane. A composition is meant to lead the eye throughout. What kind of lines do we have going on in this image? The path? What else? The trees, good. There's another one. Do we have another one? The people. The people are little lines, yes. What else? The grass. The grass does create a sort of outline, yeah, sort of reinforcing that path. We also have this cavernous opening that basically creates a long line that severs our image down in half. It's almost a completely symmetrical image, save for that little spiral or S curve, right? So use lines as a means to reinforce the directionality of the way the gaze moves through the picture plane. Look for symmetry. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Symmetry can be used, but what it does is it reinforces a kind of holiness to an image. Generally, when you see symmetry in an image, you will find it in religious imagery or spiritual imagery because it's meant to be a sort of perfect balance of universal elements, okay? So know that that's actually not a terrible thing. Is this image completely symmetrical? No. What's offsetting it? Trees. The Trees. The re what do you mean? The reflect, uh, on the sidewalk or the road, the reflection. Yeah. Well, if you, if you bisect it right in half, is it completely symmetrically mirrored? No. In fact, it's a little above the center line horizontally, isn't it? So the majority of the image is actually the water. Ain't that funny? Yeah, but it's not true symmetry is my point. You follow? Yeah. So it's these little elements that make it sort of like not necessarily Wes Anderson. Have you all seen Wes Anderson films? Grand Budapest Hotel? Those are about true symmetry. Very rarely do you look at them and see something completely off or a counterbalance. This has a little bit of a counterbalance by being just slightly off. Focus on a single subject at a time. Don't try to create, uh, or at least to begin with, don't try to create two focal points, okay? Old man by the sea. Use color blocking. What does that mean? Color blocking is a sort of range of one color as a sort of dominance, right? Um, if you are using some sort of color blocking, you need to have something that is its counterpoint. Something that, it, like right here, we've got the cherry blossoms, right? Pink cherry blossoms. 
What is its counterpoint? The building. How is the building formally different than the cherry blossoms? Mm hmm. What else? Shape. shape. Tell me more about the shape. The cherry blossoms are organic and soft, and the building is geometric. Yes. So we have two diametrically opposed shape structures. One is also cooler than the other, right? See all that gray, that gray blue, right? Even that red is a cooler red, right? So we have two entirely different temperatures going on as well. And I think you should take some abstractions. Look at the world a little differently. It doesn't have to be made up entirely of people. In fact, most of your day that you go through doesn't necessarily have people in it. Okay? Abstractions can teach you a lot about composition, um, but abstractions can tell you about how to organize pattern and how to actually lead the eye in a way that doesn't rely on the psychology of having a person in it. I know there's people in it. I'm not blind. But you get my point. Set your cameras focus. Do that. Muy importante. All right, an experiment with exposure. So. What you can do with exposure is you can change the aperture setting, like how long that lens is open. You can Google that and find out exactly how to do that. That means that if you're going to a club and you're gonna listen to some Beyonce, and you wanna take really fast motion blurred images that are incredibly dynamic for your photo series, by playing with the actual exposure, you can get those without having to modify them in Photoshop. Um, all right, don't lose sight of the details. Believe it or not, texture is important. It is. We and you and me are now embedded in a culture where every single photograph is manipulated post-production. Isn't that sad? It's sad. Yes, I want to look good in my professional headshots and I don't want, you know, the aging to be a thing, but the reality is is that's not actually what makes a picture interesting. That makes a professional headshot, which can be done by any schmo. It's commercial photography, it's very different. So photography at its core is really about the beauty of the natural world. And the imperfections are a part of that. Otherwise, why make art if it's not about the human ex experience? Not everything has to be glossy and branded. There are apps that you can install on your phone to take better photographs. Here are a few of them. Snapseed, Vizco. Um, Instagram can be used as a, as a camera device. Um, Flickr can be used on an iPhone as well. Um, Lightroom can also be downloaded on any phone. Lightroom, Adobe, y'all. Also, better phones. For an artist or a designer, there's two things you really need to have, a good computer and a good phone. Way back when, when I graduated, or when I was in graduate school, I bought a $5,000 camera to photograph my work as a painter. It's vital, it's crucial, it was really important. It was back when we used slides. Yes, I'm that old. Within two years, within a year of graduating, in 2006, out into the real world, getting a job in the real world, I no longer needed that camera. What I needed was a beautiful iPhone. I still use that camera, but the reality is, is these things are rapidly changing. But there are certain areas you're gonna have to make major investments. Your website, your phone, your computer. Even if you're not gonna be a computer artist. It's really important for my career because 25 to 40% of my week is devoted to the administrative things that I do on this bad boy right here. Running a small business. Okay. All right, no blur, baby. There are some ad hoc DIY ways to deal with it. You can use a cup, you can cut a cup, you can put it in a cup, and it will be your little tripod, and it will stay mobile, and you can do it at an angle. When in doubt, you can be a MacGyver. But I'm gonna recommend a mobile tripod. Also, you can use ad hoc things like aluminum foil to bounce back light. You know, you've all seen like fashion photography, maybe you've done it before, with people holding those big, big, white, spherical things. That bounces light. I don't know what they're called, I can't remember. Reflectors, Reflectors thank you. It takes a village, y'all. 
What that does is that bounces the light back in order to create a more homogeneous light source, okay? So in here, I'm going to have directional light, but if I had girlfriend over here standing over here with this reflector, well, what would happen is it would even it out. It wouldn't look so bad. It wouldn't look so harsh. Make sense? And that's all that is. That's a box with some aluminum foil on it. <laughs> that's a painting that somebody's shooting. One is good and one is bad. You see the difference? OK. All right, and settings. Um, mess with your settings. I'm not going to walk you through your settings. Uh, everybody's is going to be different. But play with them. Well worth it. Take about 15 to 20 30s. Don't sh settle on one shot, especially today when I set you, set you loose. Excuse me. And this is the difference between poor exposure, you know, big exposure and little exposure. Um, the time period that could be fractions or hours can be set on your phone. Okay. Um, the right exposure really is a balancing act. So you will sometimes, while you're shooting, have to bring up your photographs to see if you're going in the right direction, especially if you're playing with exposure, okay? See the difference? We've all seen, if you've ever been on Zillow and you're looking at property, we've all seen that real estate agent who has no idea what they're doing, and then the real estate agent who's like leveled up. And it's not the camera that they got. It's the fact that they paid a professional photographer to mess with exposure. All right, edits, different things. Cropping, you can change the angle, um, especially if you're photographing something flat. Say you've done something for your 2D design class and it's flat against the wall and you're shooting it at an angle and you didn't mean to, right? So it flares out at the bottom. You can adjust that on your phone. Adjust it on your phone. Um, all right, lighting. Use bright, indirect, natural lighting. Um, uh, I don't like suggesting fluorescence. You can actually buy daylight bulbs from Lowe's or Home Depot for like $5 a bulb. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Say you become a painter and you want to shoot your own photos and you're doing like portraits and stuff and you're working from those images, you want to invest in the right light and fluorescents are not those, okay? Um, avoid deep shadows and dappling effects unless you're, I don't know, shooting in a photography class and that's, it's about mood. Um, position the lights and the artwork carefully before taking the photo. Make sure there's no shadows concealing parts of the piece. That's really important, really important. I know you guys don't think that's important. It is. Soften the glare and intensity by diffusing the light source. Bounce it. Some hacks. If you're shooting a three-dimensional object, you want what's called an infinity roll. But you can also just use a big piece of paper. <laughs> an infinity roll is basically a roll of either fabric or paper. Sometimes they used to use like, um, like a velvet, like a... Mm, uh, I can't remember what it's called, black, velvet, and absorbed light. Um, but for the most part, artists and photographers are typically using actually paper, rolls of paper. And what that does is it doesn't create a harsh edge and allows for the light to diffuse very softly up and feature the focus item. Say you go into antiques and you want to make a little extra money and you're shooting these things for eBay, that's how you're doing it. Okay? And that's as simple as it is. There's always a DIY way to do it. I'm really into the cheap thing for y'all because I don't think it should be that expensive. Um, this is the difference between shooting something inside and shooting something outside. Do you see? Not being aware of the context of the lighting really will make or break an image. Um, why is it important? This is called color cast. One is correct and one isn't. Which one do you think is not correct? The smaller one is more correct. So the painter doesn't intend for that cast to be yellow. What the painter is doing is shooting this image into a space where there's incandescent lights, those yellow light bulbs. That will set an entire cast against everything that they're shooting, hence there. So you can change this in like Snapseed. Um, you can also change it in your Photoshop, but it's, mm, I don't recommend it. I recommend just shooting it in a good place. Change the white balance. Uh, way back when, when we shot slides, when we actually used film, oftentimes you would see next to like an artwork, you would see a little um, spectral like rainbow. And it's not because the artist was a part of Le Jibba It was because it told the person who was developing the slides what true red was because they can match it what true yellow is, what true white is. Now, when you have a, an actual white piece of paper, um, 
the white balance can be set and, uh, and calibrated towards your phone. So it will always correct it for you. Because if I take that phone and I go outside and I shoot in that, in that little bit of um, shadow there, it's going to be blue. That white is going to be blue. So these are things that you really need to know. And we're at a lot of text that I'm going to read to you very quickly. All right, and share it with you. All right, questions before we jump into the assignment? Nothing? Comments? So thirsty. Ooh, why is she so slow? Okay. This is called a Rubens vase. How many of you have ever um, seen something like that? Do you know the story about it? Oh, wait. It's a psychological phenomenon about how the brain can turn things into a positive negative reversal. How the brain and the eye are connected in order to make sense of the visual whole, but can flip like a switch as well. Okay? So it's a psychological phenomenon. The Rubens vase is meant to illustrate that. And this is partial Rubens vase. If I cut off the top, that's an exact Rubens vase. Um, and obviously the guy who invented that theory, guess what his last name was? Yeah. All right, so what you're going to do is you're going to create your own Rubens vase using a self-portrait. You're welcome, your profile. You're going to pair up with a friend today, and you're going to photograph each other's profiles. And you're going to think about everything I talked about and you snored through during that lecture. Hold on, we'll get there. Questions at the end. Let me get through it. Um, you're going to use your own profile in order to create a vase. Out of that vase, there needs to be something interesting added to that element. So you can think about the general function of what goes in a vase, like flowers, like lavender, like whatever, put toilet paper rolls. I don't care. I do care. Uh, or something completely foreign to what doesn't actually belong there, like this, these tiny little moths. And that's what those are. Those are not butterflies. They're moths. Um, so you're going to think about that visual ambiguity and self-representation by creating a symmetrical Rubens vase. Now the symmetrical part is the vase itself. The rest of it doesn't, whatever comes out of the vase, and there has to be something coming out of the vase, does not have to be symmetrical. That's where you have to be clever. Because almost all of you are going to jump to flowers. Be clever. Be creative. All right? Um, you can use Photoshop, you can use um, Illustrator if you want to. I'm letting that be open, but I'm going to suggest Photoshop. I'm going to show you a couple things with Photoshop uh, right after this. It's going to be a single color. It doesn't have to be black and white. Um, but one of them has to be either black or white. Does that make sense? So it doesn't have to be just black and white, but you have to use either black or white if you're going to choose a color. Is that clear? OK. Um, all right. Your final image should be created at 300 dpi using RGB color mode and saved as a JPEG file. I went over the spiel about turning that in. I've got the exact instructions. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to get some photographs. You're going to work with somebody. Um, you can think about how you want to be seen. You can make a face. I don't care how you do this. It can be very pretty. It can be very horrible. It can be awful. It can be horrible. Um, you're creating that symmetrical vase. You're incorporating your facial features by basically like tight editing. And I'll show you kind of what I mean by that. That may actually mean going in very, very close and painting using those pixels. Um, I want you to, if you choose a color, you're thinking about high contrast. Because it's not going to work if you've got a number five on the value scale, which is red, and black, which is a number nine. Those two are not going to have the, the, the back and forth that needs to happen. So if you're going to choose a color and you're going to, black is going to be your uh, chosen black or white black, then maybe like baby blue or like hot pink, something that is a very, very, very low uh, uh, value that, so that they're completely high contrast. The only reason that works is because of its high contrast. Do you understand? And I need it to be flat. There's no pattern in this. Flat. Flat color. Um, all right, your process statement. And then I've got what I'm grading you on, your conceptual execution, your technical proficiency, your creative interpretation of the project, 
its visual impact in general, is it successful? And then of course your process statement itself. All of those combined together um, in order to add up to 10 points. So two points for each thing, very simple. Questions before going to the demo. I'm just gonna use something that I find online for a face, but I want you to use yours because I didn't think far ahead enough to use my own face. And that's called a profile. Let's use like her. She's not big enough, so I'll go to my tools, size, large. Let's use her. A thousand. We're good. I'm drag and drop her off on my business there. Open up my Photoshop. All right. Now, because I'm not actually using her like final photograph, I don't need to worry so much about how pixelated she's going to be. You have a quick question? Yes. No, you're facing away from the camera, giving a profile. I'm going to show you what I mean. Hold on. All right, I'm going to use an 8.5 by 11, 300 DPI, white background. We'll start off with that. I can always change the color. Okay? Now, I'm going to drag and drop her into Photoshop. I'm going to change her and do some image edits. You should start playing with your image edits. If you go to image and adjustments, you can do a lot of things. You can play with the exposure, the levels, the curves, play with those things on your own time, okay? You can play with the brightness and contrast. I can go right to black and white, but the easiest way to go black and white is to actually change the mode of the photograph because I'm not gonna use her color. I don't need all that detail. So image, mode, and then I'm gonna go to grayscale. And I'm already on RGB, but grayscale is what I want. I'm discarding all of the color information, okay? You'll notice that there's a new AI thing up in here, up in here, which I love. It's called select subject. That's gonna be the easiest thing for you to do. So I'm gonna take that subject and select it. And it will do it for me. So easy. The other way to do that, if I don't wanna do that, deselect, is I can use my magic wand tool. Because she's on a, an even ground and I don't have like business like the background to deal with, I can simply go to the magic wand tool. I can click on the background. It'll select the whole background. And I can, if I want to select this, I'm actually going to take her hair out because I don't need it because it will undo what I want to do. Um, but I can actually just take her hair out by keep pressing down shift and I click that area as well. So I can double click on an area as long as shift is, is on. Now, that selects the background. So I actually want to select her. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to select and inverse. Inverse, now I've got her. Make sense? Okay. I'm going to move her over her. I'm going to go to my, um, my move tool. I'm going to drag and drop her over here. Now, how do I bring up those handlebars again? Command. I don't like that generally because it's too confusing. I go to Command-T, come up. I press um, Shift while pulling it so that, oh, no, it's not Shift. I'm sorry. Edit, undo. I screwed it. It's Control. Nope. It's Option. <laughs> yes, I can do it regularly if it's set. But sometimes it's, un it's unclicked. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of like, mm, All right, now I want a Rubens vase to look at, just to sort of give me an, a, an idea about what I want to do. And I'm going to advise you to draw yours in your sketchbook, draw your Rubens vase. But just as a sort of help, I'll drag and drop that off so that I always have that to kind of look at. All right, now I know that she's going to be on the side here. And I'm not going to use 
for example, her, um, I'm not going to use the neck and whatnot. I'm just going to pull her off. Okay, I'll press enter. Am I going to use this whole thing? No, I could probably do what I want to do with her now. There's a million ways to do this. So I'm going to click on the background using my magic wand tool. Click on the background, do the same thing, inverse, and I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to paint her black real quick. Okay, so that I'm not thinking about her as an identity anymore. Actually, that's not black. We're going to make sure it's black. And you see there that hex code 000? That's when I know it's true black. Okay, that's going to be the easiest thing. Um, I am going to, since she's selected, I am going to um, copy what I just did. She's still selected. Copy. I'm going to deselect. And I'm actually going to turn the image vertical. So if I go to image, I can go to my adjustments basically and go to image rotation. I'm going to flip the canvas horizontal. Then I can go command V and the other one will show up. And I have the beginnings of my Rubens vase. Okay. Um, what I want to do is I want to play with the negative space. And you know, it'll snap to grid there because I've already got that basically set. And see how much actual space I want. And I kind of like that. I'm not adjusting her scale or anything like that. It's at this point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually lock it. I don't really want to mess with the layers. I'm actually OK with that. You don't have to lock it here, but I'm going to lock it here. Okay. And how I do that is I go to Layer and Flatten Image. Okay. All my layers are gone. It's at this point that I can start to play with how I want to deal with the actual vase itself. Um, I can reverse this. Now, it's been a minute since I've done that. I can go to invert. And it will automatically invert and choose the colors for me. And I can simply change those colors by painting if I want to, or filling. And you can fill in a variety of ways. All right. So that's the first couple of steps. Paint all that. Get her taken care of. Like off into the distance? No, I'm going to show you how to. No, no. Um, should the, like, are we making the base black? Like, should the base it's up to you. Okay. It can be either or, which is why I kind of left it open in terms of color. And I think that's it, right? OK. What I'm going to do here at this point is I'm probably going to put her on a new um, artboard before I actually start to um, build this. But what I want to do is I want to make an ellipse out of the top. And start to play with actually making this an enclosed vase. So you're going to play um, and try to figure out a way to make a vase. And I'm just going to kind of uh, put another one in. And once I'm satisfied with this vase, I'm going to put it on a better artboard. And I want you to put a lot more into it than what I put in and center it. Now, it needs a lot of edits. I got a bunch of stuff right here. This is not a perfect ellipse. This is weird. I'm going to correct that. And if you zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, you notice because it's a, it's a bitmap, not a vector, it's going to have these little jagged businesses. I can adjust those little jagged businesses if I want to, but really what I'm looking for is an interesting shape. And I did that in what, like five minutes? It's not terribly interesting. I think I need another ellipse up here. I might need a little bit more going on, but that is essentially a Rubens vase. 
questions.